My name is Muveo, as you heard. Um, I'm sure you're wondering why I need a stool. Uh, if you read James uh, chapter 3, um, the first verse of James chapter 3 uh, says that not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So I might need my stool as a weight of those words sinking. Uh, but also, I don't know about you, but the heat has been so intense. Um, it's been getting to me. So every once in a while, I find myself being short of breath and whatnot. So this is for my good as well as yours. Um, so uh, last week, we started um, a new series on technology and looking at several aspects of technology and how uh, we interact with technology as followers of Christ. And Bonisi took us through um, the theology of togetherness. And if you forgot everything that he said, um, this one thing, at least I hope you remember, um, the encouragement for us to, to show up, to be present, uh, physically present in life because technology has this way of causing us to be virtually present, but not so present where it really matters. And so I'm going to pick it up today uh, with the theology of words and we look at how uh, words, the impact that words have and how technology has affected um, how we use our words and how we perceive words and things like that. And so a warm welcome to those of us joining us online. Um, and I trust that God through his word uh, will speak and minister to us this morning. And so words... Words are an integral part really of who we are. We are, if I kept quiet right now and said nothing for the next five minutes, it would be super awkward, right? So it's, we would be gathered here and the silence would just be like, okay, why, why did I leave home? Why did I come all this way to be sent to silence? So words are, are a powerful part of our existence and Community is really community because of one of the reasons is because of words. We share words of encouragement. We speak to one another. We communicate. If we didn't have words to communicate, uh, even in our silence, sometimes we, we still communicate and we perceive that communication in terms of words, even when none are spoken. And so we, we think with words. We hear words. We speak words. We type words these days. We don't speak as much, I guess, but with our gadgets and whatnot, we are constantly speaking with our fingers. We read words. If you love reading, then books um, and any material that you come across, the, the reason you are able to perceive what is being said in that is because there's words that you read. We listen to words, it's music, podcasts, and all those kinds of things. But we also remember with words when we have memories of places we've been, uh, conversations we've had. Those memories are, are sort of stamped because of the words that we associate with those memories. And so we cannot separate words from our existence. And even it's interesting that even, for example, with our deaf brothers and sisters here who may not be able to audibly speak out words, they still have a language that is sign language that is based yet again on words. And so regardless of um, how we hear or perceive words, we cannot separate words from our existence, regardless of where we live on this planet, regardless of our abilities, um, regardless of even the color of our skin. We, some of us are here from very different um, uh, places in terms of geography, from a different part of this world, but you're here and we are able to communicate, communicate and um, be in community together because we have words that we share with one another. And so words yet again, are an important part of who we are. And it's interesting to note that words are mostly associated with women, right? There's this, you know, we usually say that women, and science, I guess, and research has proven that women generally speak about 20,000 words a day compared to 7,000 by men. But the truth of the matter is that women, women may speak more in terms of words, but this doesn't mean that men are not interacting with words, right? Just because they're not speaking them, doesn't mean that words are not an important part of their lives, right? So they type words, right? They are thinking about things in words. Uh, they are engaging on, you know, they are having meetings in their heads by themselves in that in nothing space sometimes with words, right? And so when words are generally associated with women because we express these words, that doesn't exclude any of us from words. 
Now, the truth is, as I said, we all have memories we remember with words. And some of our fondest life memories, if I was asking to describe some of your fondest life memories, you would have beautiful words to say. Um, if it was associated, say, with love, a place you visited, as you're describing the trip that you took that, you know, has stayed with you in your memory, you would have words that you would use to describe uh, that experience or that conversation that you had with a friend. Now, the truth of the matter is that we have a complicated relationship with words, right? Because words are not, they are not linear in terms of they're just good words and good memories that we have uh, where words are concerned. A lot of us actually have a really complicated relationship with words because words for some of us, those memories that I talked about, are painful memories because of words spoken by someone which has spoken a better word in your life. Over your life. So, for example, the words, uh, the harsh words of a father who didn't affirm or love and instead was abusive and neglectful with his words, that's a memory that's painful. And so, words for some of us don't necessarily represent something nice. Uh, it could be the words of a harsh boss who sees nothing but the worst in you, even when you've given your best and tried your hardest. And so, words have a really painful place in your life. But words also have beautiful memories, right? If you're a parent, you remember the first words that your child spoke. And I'm sure that's a memory that is not going away uh, from you anytime soon. And sadly, they, I don't know about yours, but mine all said they called their dad fast. And while it's a good memory, it's also like, guys, I carried you for nine months, and the first words out of your mouth were tata. Quite unfair, but memorable words. Um, if you're a parent and you're having a conversation with your child, is they grow in your vocabulary, their vocabulary, and you hear them using big words. I remember the first time my two year old said, Mama is at the phlebotomist's office. And I nearly fell off my seat because how does a two year old mind comprehend you know, such big words and pronounce them well? And so we have all these memories. If, if you're married and you remember the day you stood on that podium and exchanged vows, those are memorable words. If you're a young person and you had, or as you were growing up and you had the affirming words of your father, of a mother who cared and spoke good words to you, those are good memories that carry along with us. But the other thing that has complicated words for all of us in the day that we live in is technology, right? Words don't necessarily mean what they used to uh, before the era of technology. Um, technology in and of itself is a beautiful thing because it has enhanced our lives in ways that we would not have imagined, right? Technology has many advantages. It's given us access. We have access to information. We have access to authors and their words and great minds and thinkers all across the world that we would never have been able to access if we didn't have the phone, for example, the internet, and all that technology has done to give us access. Technology has also enhanced collaboration. You're able to work from Nairobi, Kenya with your colleagues literally anywhere across the globe because of um, technology and the fact that you're able to exchange ideas and work through projects together. Technology has also improved communication. We are able to, in real time, share thoughts, share ideas, chat with a friend, and communicate with one another. Technology has also brought entertainment close home for many of us, right? If you remember growing up in Kenya in those days when KBC was the only form of entertainment that used to start at a specific hour, there was only like one children's program and there was one TV in the neighborhood, like it was, entertainment was a mess, right? But now with our phones, uh, with internet, you literally can access entertainment anywhere, uh, even in the most rural parts of uh, wherever you are. But the thing about these advantages is that on the flip side of them is that they also pose some serious disadvantages. While we have access to information and that we are collaborating and we are communicating and we are entertained, um, I don't think there has been a time in history where we have also been so disengaged with one another. We, we tend to have this idea that because we are chatting uh, or WhatsApp all the time, and we are, you know, there is access to one another. 
we tend to we tend to create this facade that we are actually in each other's lives and engaging with each other. And the reality, when you look at the statistics around suicide and depression, tends to tell a different story. It tends to say that, yes, we are engaging on some level, but we are not really meaningfully engaging on the level that actually matters. And so we, we have a complicated, a really complicated relationship with technology. And the truth is, if we don't master, if we don't understand the effect that technology can have over us, and especially where our worlds are concerned, then we are bound to make mistakes time and time again where our words, the use or the lack of use of them is concerned. And so it's easy these days to simply on, on Instagram, even not even on WhatsApp or you know, on someone's direct number, it's easy to post words like HBB, happy birthday, and you can sit back content that, hey, I remember their birthday and I wish them a happy birthday, right? But the only reason you remembered it was their birthday was because Instagram reminded you, Facebook reminded you, and because we are being, you know, we are saving our time, who has time to type out the entire happy birthday words, right? So a quick HBD as we cruise right along and wait for the next person or the next thing. Worse still, even when our friends and family or people around us lose our loved ones. It's so easy to get on their timeline and quickly type RIP as we quickly move right along, right? And we miss out on the aspect of literally being there. Remember what we talked about last Sunday, the, the, the presence, the physical presence that makes all the difference. And so while technology has been a blessing to us, we see that it poses some serious challenges that require us to take a step back and think about what really is the place of this uh, our use of words where technology is concerned. Um, some of the things specific to words that we see uh, in the use of technology is this whole idea of the cyberbullying. Um, we've heard stories of people who have actually taken their lives because of cyberbullying. They were trolled on the internet and made to feel as though they did not deserve to be living in this world anymore. And research has shown that cyberbullying has produced more suicides than any other kind of bullying before the internet ever existed. And so we cannot ignore um, the power that our words have and this relationship that we have with words, um, even as we engage with technology. And so today I want us to look at this whole, um, our relationship with words and to see what this means for us, but also how we ought to respond as the children of God. And we're going to look at this in three very simple um, points, which are words are powerful. Um, I'm sure we all know that. Uh, but the second thing is that our words, and especially when we talk about the dark side of our words, that our words are actually a heart issue. And the third thing I want us to do uh, before we leave here, it would be very hopeless if I left us at the point where our hearts are powerful, uh, words are powerful, okay, go and be powerful. Uh, our, heart, our words are a heart issue, but it would be hopeless if I left it at that and did point us to Jesus, who has something to say by his words, but also by his example about what we ought to do with our words. And so I would like to leave us with beholding Jesus as the example that we ought to follow, but also in the words that he speaks. And so the power of our words. When we think of words, I think Nothing speaks better about the power of words than the creation story and the way in which God used his spoken word to bring everything that exists into existence. Now, in Genesis 1, we see God using his words to magnificently create the world that we know today, right? He, in, in Genesis 1, has this grand introduction, which is a powerful narration of God using his words to create everything that exists, and he creates everything out of nothing. Now, the intros to the six days of creation, day one to six, all of them start like this, and God said, and with just the power of his words, he created everything that is. And the end of every day ends like this, and God saw that it was good. Now, if I was to stop there, I think I would have preached an entire sermon by itself that 
God used his words to create something. And we did just end there that once he created the things that he wanted to create, he, he was able to look back at the end of the day, sit back and look at his creation, and he could confidently declare that it was good. And maybe there's something in there for us uh, where our words are concerned, that we should be able to look back at our interactions online, our interactions in person, and if we are using God's standard as a measure, then we maybe should be able to ask ourselves, was it good? Did I fall short in some way or another? And if we did that one thing and nothing else, I believe our words would have more impact, positive impact than anything else. Now, it's interesting that even though man was not created by the spoken word of God, that God, before creating Adam, actually, first of all, declares his intent to create man by the use of spoken word. And so we have, excuse me, before he ever picked up that ball of clay and, you know, molded it into this man called Adam, God declares his intentions and he says in Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And with this one declaration of intention that what God wanted to do, we see that God did not just declare what he was going to do, but he also declared the how and the why for what it is that he wanted to do. He said, we're going to make man, but we're not just going to make man, we're going to make him in our image, in our likeness. We're not just going to make him to exist for nothing, but we're making him to rule over creation, to take dominion. And so we see that the mandate that brings us as the descendants of, of Adam into the earth are filled with intent, they are filled with purpose. And so we cannot carelessly use our words because then we were not just created carelessly for nothing. We were created for intent and we were created purposefully in the image and in the likeness of God. We see further in verses 28 to 30, God blessing man, that God blesses man and gives him the manifesto for life uh, by his spoken word. And it's interesting to note that at the end of day six, when God was done with creation, now if you attended, if you participated in uh, service planning, you know that at the end of services or like when the starting meets on Mondays, we have this session called Do Differently, right? Where we sit back and figure out what did go so well, what we need to work on. But when God was done with creation at the end of day six, I can tell you for a fact that there was no Do Differently Trinity meeting happening on that day. They sat together and God declared this in Genesis 1.31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. The culmination of the work of his words and his hands in creating ended in the declaration that he looked back and saw that it was all very good. And so we see here that words have power to create, they have the power to give life, to bring hope, to bring healing and peace and unity. Words have the power to correct, to instruct, to give wisdom and even to encourage. But as I say, words also have the power to steal kill and destroy. It is no wonder the devil is referred to as the father of lies because his mission with the words that he speaks, which we see yet again in Genesis in the story of the fall, is that his words come to take us away from the promise that God has given us and the declaration that is spoken over us as to who we are. And so when we use our words to gossip, slander, discourage, manipulate, cause division and discord, to wound others, to exclude others, then we realize that we are using our, the power of our words for evil and not the intent that God had for us when he created us in his image and gave us um, the mandate to take dominion over his creation. And so as I said before, we cannot, we cannot carelessly and mindlessly engage with technology and one another. We must be aware of the words that we speak, the words we type, the words we read and even listen to, the words that we think, because these words are like seeds planted that in due harvest will reap a harvest. Words have power and words reap a harvest. 
Now, one of my favorite authors is uh, a gentleman called Paul Tripp. Uh, and he says, in talking about words, that there are no neutral words. There are only life-giving or deathful words. And the reason there are no neutral words is because words that, in whatever form that we engage with words, our words are laden with intent, either good or bad. Our words always have context, so there are no words that just come out of nothing. Our words have context, but our words are also carrying alongside them our experiences. And so we speak out of our experiences, whether good or bad. If it's good experiences, then we speak good words that then point to good experiences and vice versa. But we also have words that are coming from a place, as I say before, of unresolved trauma, unresolved pains. And so words are just never really words, right? Proverbs 18, 21 reminds us that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who live by it will eat its fruits. Words, like I say, are like trees or like uh, seeds planted, and they will reap a harvest. James, in uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, uh, tells us a little bit um, about the power of words, and he says this. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. We can take ships as an example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself uh, set on fire by hell. Listen to this. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Guys, that's, that's our words, that's our talents. That we are hopelessly lost if we are the authority of our own words. Because as we see here, our tongues are small but have the power to literally steer destinies. They have the, the power to make or break destinies. Our words have the power to heal or to remain. Our words can birth, they can kill dreams. Our words can make and even distort identities. Look at this whole issue of image today, perpetuated so much by the things that we see on social media, where young, beautiful girls and even boys, because of the words that they've seen, their entire identities are twisted and they are not able to look in the mirror and see themselves for the beauty that God has created them in. Words are powerful. But it's important for us to note that our words are not just a function of our mouths, right? Our words, as I said in our second point, are our words are a heart issue. Our words truly expose what's really going on in our hearts. And so they're not just a function of speech or vocabulary, and I like me some good vocabulary. You know, I like it when I pick up a book and the author is just playing around with words in a beautiful way. I enjoy that. Words are not just a function of grammar or technique or even the number of languages that one can speak. Our words are a function of our hearts. Luke chapter 6, verses 43 reminds us this. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not just pick figs from the thorn bushes or grapes from grapes. A good man brings good things out of the good that is stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so as I say, we do not just speak merely out of the movement of muscles in our mouths. We don't just speak out of the wealth of our vocabulary or our intelligence 
or our knowledge on subjects or our experiences based on you know, the things we've done and accomplished in life, or even our emotions. At the heart of every word is our heart. And it's, if it's true then that there are no neutral words, then it goes by saying that there are no neutral hearts. We are either speaking our words from a life-giving place, and that's where our heart is, or from a broken place that then has the power to birth death. Jeremiah 17, 19 says this, The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. Now, if, if our words are powerful and our words are the function of our hearts and our hearts are hopelessly dark and deceitful, then we have a real problem, right? Because it means that if the nature of our hearts is darkness and deceit and scripture says that it's a puzzle that no one can figure out, then we have a real heart problem, our word problem is a heart problem that is beyond our ability to solve by ourselves. And so you've seen in social media lately, there's a lot of you know, talk about being kind with our words as we ought to be, right? To be mindful. Mindfulness is, is a trend that's going on all around the world. But I dare say that the cure for all the hate, the malice that we see in the world, the racism, the cancel culture, the trolling, and all these things that our words are producing. The words that we use to still kill and destroy is not going to be found in merely just being kind and empathetic and inclusive of one another. The problem is that our, our words are a heart problem. And if we are going to deal with the problem of our words, we are going to have to do that on a much deeper level. Kindness can be superficial because we know how to do that when someone is watching, right? So if we are doing kindness for kindness sake, then it has no power to transform and put real life into our words. If we are being empathetic for the sake of being, you know, flowing with the trend that's happening around us, then we have a problem because our empathy on our own strength can only run so far. If we are being inclusive for the sake of maintaining the peace and not wanting to be controversial with one another or to be caught on the wrong side of things, then we still have a problem because we haven't dealt with the root of the problem of our words, which is our hearts. Our hearts, as we said, are deceitful and left to themselves. Uh, the only thing, the only fruit that our hearts can bear in and of themselves is the fruit that steals, kills, and destroys. And so it's, it's unfortunate to imagine that with all that's going on with our words and the world, uh, that the solution will not be found in the world out there by pushing for all the, the agenda of kindness and inclusivity and all of that. The solution will actually require children of the light like you and I to interact with this issue and to interrogate it on a much deeper level so that then we are bringing solutions to the world that will actually last and solutions that have the power to change and transform lives beyond the superficial. And the social media, as we know, um, the interactions that we have uh, with technology have really um, changed our interactions and superficiality is, is just the norm. It's easy to really not know what's going on with anyone anymore, right? Because everyone is fine. Everyone is living the life. If we look at our pictures on Instagram, no one posts their worst days on Instagram. And I mean, if you're trying to make a career out of podcasting and all of that and social media, it's not going to go anywhere when you're posting, you know, all the bad things that have happened in your life. But even at the heart of all these things, if we really take a look back and interrogate even our motives and how we are interacting with this social media, it speaks further to the issue that we have a heart problem because we have 
entered this space of deceit, which is, is really what it is, that we don't want anyone to, to know the reality, the truth of what is going on behind us. For some, it's the shame of, if they really knew me for who I really am, maybe I would not be accepted, maybe I would not be loved. For others, it's just this idea of mindlessness. We, we don't think, I mean, technology is there, so let's just use it, right? And so we don't put thought, we don't put um, anything into the things that we put out there. And so when we look at the different interactions that we have with technology, we cannot help but come to the conclusion that our hearts are at the core of this issue and we have a real problem where our hearts are concerned. As I said, if I was to leave it there, we would be one completely hopeless bunch, right? Uh, it would be like, okay, so we are hopeless. Um, we are doomed to death if um, we are the authority of our, over our, our words. But I'd like us to quickly shift focus because everything I've said up until now uh, at the power of our words and how they can kill and destroy, uh, the problem of our hearts being deceitful um, and unable to do anything right, um, then that must quickly point us to words beholding Jesus. Because Jesus, through the selfless death that he died on the cross, purchasing for us a righteousness that we could never afford, and through the Holy Spirit working out that righteousness in our lives every single day, that, my friends, is the only solution that we have for our hearts. That we have to behold Jesus in the fullness of everything that he has done to purchase our redemption. The cure that is needed there is the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit alive and at work in us in every waking moment of our lives. But by the grace of God, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would have absolutely no capacity to produce transforming kindness, transforming love, transforming encouragement, hope, peace, unity, wisdom, correction, and instruction. As I said, we are at best superficial in our speech, in the intentions of our hearts, and the roots of anger, malice, slander, jealousy, gossip, division, judgment, racism, violence, judgment, and condemnation will continue to rear their ugly head. They might be cooled down for a moment when we try to be kind and empathetic and inclusive, but they will rise their head again because that kind of that kind of superficiality will not last, will not last. And so allow me to speak to us who are already followers of Jesus Christ, for those who have accepted the, this gift that Jesus has offered. We then cannot be the same ones that bring death with our words. We cannot be the bearers of darkness where our words is concerned. James in uh, chapter three, verse nine says this, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with the same tongue, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, and this is the warning, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And James, he's very clear. He's not mincing his words here. He's very clear as to what it is the expectation is for followers of Jesus Christ, that we cannot with the same mouth praise and worship our God and in the same breath curse our brothers and sisters who are made in the image of, and likeness of God. And so Jesus alone, my friends, is a cure for our unbelievably wicked hearts, which then calls for a response from us. The truth is all of us are guilty, guilty of breaking others with our words, guilty of lies that we have told with our words, guilty of being careless with our words. All each of us is guilty of using our words in a way that is not glorifying to God. If you're a parent, you, you know that you have 
I have, at least I know, I have used my words in a way that was not building up, right? In moments of anger and frustration, shouted at the children and said words that I would later regret, right? As a boss in the marketplace, as you're frustrated with your employees and wondering, can anyone never do anything right? We have used our words to destroy others, right? And we can all look back at our lives and pinpoint not one, not two, not 10, not 20, many times where our words um, have not been honoring to God. But what God requires of us is to be open to the working of the Holy Spirit so that as we are filled with the Spirit, then we can be empowered to live by the Spirit and to live the kind of life that produces the fruit of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, then we are unable to have the kind of fruit that then impacts how we use our words. Galatians 5.22 reminds us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of which are things that we can directly apply to our use of words, right? And so it says that those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And therefore, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The solution to our words um, being honoring to God as we behold Jesus is keeping in step with the Spirit because he alone has the power to, be, to produce the fruit that is required of us that would transform our words. And so what does this mean for us? When we realize that we have used our words in a, no, in a way that's not honoring, and the first thing as we acknowledge our wrong where our words are concerned is that we must be able to come humbly before the Lord in repentance. When we behold Jesus and everything that he has done to us, when we, for us, when we look at the death that he died on the cross and we see ourselves for who we truly are, our response then must be one of humbly repenting before our Lord and Savior because he has paid the price uh, for our sin, for our unrighteousness, including even our words and the ways we have used uh, them in breaking others. So we must be uh, humble enough to present our words and the ways that we have used them wrongfully uh, and present them to God because he uh, alone is able to cleanse and forgive us. The psalmist put it this way, in realizing uh, the need to be cleansed by God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And he says, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, we know, we are not even being you know, unsure about whether or not our words have had negative impact. And so our place is to come to God and say, Lord, cleanse me, search me, Lord, know my heart, test me and cleanse me and lead me back to your way everlasting. But the second thing that we need to do is that we need to remember, because sometimes we forget, we forget that the people that we speak with, the people that receive our words are people created in the image of God. And so we need to remember every day a need for God's redeeming grace. Because outside of that memory, then we treat the people around us as though they are not recipients of that same redeeming grace. And remembering God's redeeming grace causes us to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is by grace that we have been saved and through faith. It is not of ourselves. And so we cannot be boastful with our words, we cannot be careless with our words because we are recipients of grace and that same grace we must be able to extend to the others who are also made in the image and likeness of God. The other thing that I call us to do this morning is to culture our words by the word of God. We love, we study, and we live by the word of God because his word is powerful. It changes us and it has the power to influence even our speech. Psalm 119, 105 reminds us that, by your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. 
I have committed myself and I will never turn back from living by your righteous order. We must make a personal commitment to culture our words by the word of God, by studying his word, by living by his word, and by loving his word and walking in obedience with it. The other thing which really speaks directly into our era of technology is that in our engagement with words is that we must esteem and walk and love with people more than we take stands on issues and offer opinions on issues. Now, there's no shortage of issues that require your voice and your opinion. All you need to do is get on any social media platform and there's a cause for anything that you can name, right? And there's, there's this tendency to want to speak into every situation and to, to respond to everything and to make a stand. Where do you stand on this issue? Where do you stand on this issue? What's your opinion on this issue? But I challenge us today that our call and the command that God has given us has nothing to do with issues. It has nothing to do with positions if it doesn't first have to do with his people. Luke 10, 27, Jesus said these words, uh, summing up the law, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. So guys, in as much as it's tempting to want to put our voices into everything, God's call and the command that he has given us is to first and foremost, love him with everything that we have. And once we've done that, is to love our neighbor. We must not love our positions, our opinions, and our, our agendas more than we love the neighbor that is right next to us, uh, whether it's virtually or physically, that neighbor, that person who has been created in the image and the likeness of God. It therefore then speak, speaks that we must be quick to listen, we must be slow to speak. James 1.19 reminds us of this, that we must be quick to listen which means we have to slow down where our words are concerned and take a moment to hear what's really being said. And to even ask yourself, do I really need to say something? Must I respond to everything that's thrown in my way? In the words of my uh, eight-year-old, one of my twins, if you, if you keep hearing this in this week, I think you'll be fine. Just listen, mama. Just listen. Take time and listen. Take time and understand. Take time and see where people are coming from. Take time and see even beyond the hurtful words that people are saying to you. Some of it is a cry for help. But if we are so quick to respond to everything, then we realize we're just throwing our words everywhere for no reason. Allow me to take a moment to speak to those of us who have been deeply wounded and broken by the words of others. I need you to remember this. I need us to remember this that Jesus speaks a better word over all of us than any of the broken words or the, broke, the words that have broken us that have been spoken over us. And so I need you to behold Jesus today because he speaks a, word, a better word, a word of healing. He speaks truth over your life. He declares who you are, that you are loved, redeemed, and that he's purchased to you by his precious blood. And so you can believe the words of Jesus concerning your life and concerning the things that have happened to you. If he says you are loved, then that's it. If he says you are healed, you're redeemed, you're restored, that's it. Believe Jesus. But I call us to even a deeper level to forgive those who have forgiven, those who have broken us with their words. Because that healing will not really come until we are able to release these people through our forgiveness to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we make a decision that we shall make that first step towards forgiving this person and starting this journey. And the third thing I'm calling us to is to heal. That we must heal from the broken words, from the words that have broken us, spoken over us. Whatever it takes, if it means starting a conversation with someone, if it means going and getting therapy so that you can deal with the trauma of the words that have broken you, whatever it takes, Jesus has already paid the price for our freedom. We need to take the steps towards walking in that freedom that Jesus has already purchased for us. Jesus de desires for us to be free 
uh, because it says somewhere that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Your freedom has already been purchased. It's, it has already been paid for. So you, you ought not to walk um, in the shadow of words that have broken you, that have been spoken over you. Believe the better word that Jesus has spoken over your life. As I bring this to a conclusion, there are some amongst us today that haven't made that decision for Jesus Christ. Above mastering your words, I could give you 10 steps on how to be an excellent communicator. I could give you strategies for using your words in a way that causes people to favor you and all of that. But I tell you, my brothers and sisters this morning, there is no salvation to be found in a rich vocabulary, in a thriving social media presence, in a million likes, comments, thousands of online friends and followers. Salvation is only to be found in Jesus Christ through the death he died on that rugged cross and how he rose again on the third day so that you and I may truly live. This Jesus who in John 1.1 1, 1 is said to be, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made and without him nothing has been made. In him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. Brothers and sisters, regardless of where you are and how words have affected you or how words, or how you have used your words uh, in a way that have affected others, Jesus is calling us this morning to behold him because he alone has the power to transform us. He alone has the power to work even through technology and with all the negative attributes. We have the power through Jesus Christ to bring transformation, to bring healing, and to point people even to Jesus Christ through our words. So as the music team comes up, I'd like us to remember today that we behold Jesus because he is the living word. We behold Jesus because he alone has the power to change and transform our hearts and cause our words to be words that speak blessing, to be words that are redemptive in nature, to be words that are grace-filled, to be words that build and not words that destroy.